Welcome to the Every Nation West Coast podcast. We are so glad that you joined us. Let's get into the Word. Father, I pray for each one of us this morning that as I share your Word, that you will speak to our hearts. Father, not my words, not my will, but Lord, that you will speak directly to our hearts. I pray for open hearts. I pray, Lord God, for the ability to understand I pray, Lord God, for revelation. I pray for freedom in people's lives today because of your word. And so, Lord, I pray that you will work in power through this word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, I've been blessed this week. My old phone died and insurance paid out, so I got a new phone, hallelujah. Um, but if you, I did want to say, I send a broadcast message to many people every, normally every Sunday, at least once a week. If you don't get a broadcast message from me, it means I've lost your number. Okay. So if you didn't get one today, this morning, I don't have your number. So please ask, give the number to reception at the end and I'll add you back into my broadcast list. Okay. Um, so with this fancy phone, it comes a thing to, so I can, I can time my sermon. So to make sure I don't go over time. And everyone said, Amen. (laughs) I used to, when I was growing up, I used to have a, um, I used to come to church with a roll of triple X mints. And then I would tell how how boring or exciting the service was by how quickly I went through those those triple X mints. Okay, so so don't, don't tell me if you've got triple X mints in your pocket. So the word today is entitled, Do You Not Remember? And so we, last Sunday, last weekend, had an amazing time at our Easter service. And it was amazing to see so many people here. We actually had the biggest number we've ever had at Every Nation West Coast, 200 people on the dot here in the service. And so it was a full service, a busy service. And I preached on the resurrection power of Jesus And so it was an amazing service. But this week past has been a bit of a weird one. Um, My wife is still at home sick, and I I do want to say thank you to everyone who's been praying for her. She had an operation, so she's doing significantly better. But thank you for praying for her, and so many people have blessed us with goodies, with meals, with soup, and I wanted to say thank you to everyone for that. It's been an absolute blessing. But then to make things more interesting, I've been kind of upholding the household, realizing how much my wife actually does. Thank you, Lord, for our, 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 our wives. Um, amen. amen. Thank you, Jacques. <laughs> but as part of this, on Sunday after lunch, so I'd woken up Sunday feeling a little bit dizzy. And so on the way to church, Joe kindly prayed for me, and I, I sort of made it through the service, but still feeling a little like shaky on my feet. And then I got home, had lunch, but this dizziness was all over me. And so as I finished the lunchtime meal, I suddenly felt, I felt like I was like on a ship, but it was terrible seas. I felt like seasick. It was vertigo. It was, and, and the whole world was going like this. I, I can't do that. I start getting nauseous just thinking about it. And I ended up, I just went to sleep. And I went and lay down and actually slept the whole afternoon and slept much of Monday as, as well. And it was so like, I'm like, Lord, I'm talking about your resurrection power, but here I am, you know, lying asleep in bed. But what God showed me through that is I I then went, Monday slept, Tuesday I went to the doctor. God blessed me with a doctor that was a Christian. I'd say, Lord, bless me with a Christian doctor who's going to listen to me, who's going to help me. And he diagnosed that I had a middle ear infection and that was why I was feeling like I was. But it was also a measure of me having worked too much. So my body just needed rest as well. That's why I was sleeping so much. And so I had to listen to God in that moment and say, I need a rest. I need to take time. So he booked me off for three days. And it's funny, often when I talk to doctors or people, they ask you, what do you do? And so I always like tentatively look at them and I'm like, I'm a pastor. And then you can see either like there's like a shutter that falls in front of their eyes, dung, and they change the subject or they get all awkward. Or they go, oh, well, praise God. What church do you go to? You know, so it depends. This doctor, I said, I'm a pastor. And he said, his response is something along the lines of, can I have some pizza with that? (laughs) And I'm like, oh, pastor, 
pizza. Okay, so that was a response I hadn't had. But God blessed me with a pastor that, with a pastor, with a, with a doctor that helped me diagnose correctly. And I managed to rest. And during this time, God's revelation to me was that it's his resurrection power. Part of where I'd gone wrong is I was relying on Dennis's energy power. And I was not resting enough. And so God's challenge to me was to take time to rest. And that's what God did this week as he helped me to rest. And I believe I'm speaking to some of you this morning where some of you need to actually pause and rest. Amen? Amen. So God's been renewing my mind this week in terms of rest. And that's a little bit what I'm speaking about. I'm speaking about God renewing our mind. What does that mean? And so I'm going to start by going to a scripture I actually preached a little from. I mentioned it last time. Matthew 6 verse 9. And this is the Lord's Prayer. And so the Lord's Prayer starts something along these lines. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we see that prayer says, Lord, your kingdom come. That's how we meant to pray. Lord, your kingdom come. Lord, your will be done. Your will be done in my life on earth as it is in heaven. And what this is talking about, it's talking about heaven is meant to invade earth. That resurrection power is meant to be present in our lives. There's that, that heaven is meant to be flowing through our lives. Just the next picture you'll see on the screen is a river. And it's meant to be that resurrection power, God's presence, God's invading, the, the Holy Spirit invading earth is meant to be like this river, just filling every gap, just flowing through our lives. That's what we're, we're trusting God for. That's what we're trusting God for is every nation, West Coast, that God will work in power, that that power will flow into our community, that it will seep into the, the crevices of our community. That's what we're trusting God for, that his heart his will will invade our earth. Romans 12 says, verse 1, says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so this passage of scripture is saying our bodies need to be that spiritual worship. We also should not be conformed to this world. So in the area of rest, in the area of work, what was Dennis doing? I was been conforming to this world. Push, 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 push. Push myself because I must do this and I must do that. And a renewing of my mind in that area where, was where God was reminding me that it's, it's not about how much Dennis can do. And so that's what we need. We need a renewing of our minds. It says transformed not by the removal of our minds. We're supposed to have minds that are hearing God's word. We need to be having minds that are applying God's word to our community. That's the Holy Spirit invading our earth. That's God's will invading our earth. So we're not meant to remove our minds. But we meant to allow God to renew our minds. So what we should not be thinking is through the lens of this world. And unfortunately, because, we, because through things like this, things like media around us, we often start to look at everything around us through the lens of what the world looks like. The world measures success by this. The world measures progress like this. And we start to measure ourselves. We start to measure ourselves by the kind of car we drive or the house we live in or the clothes we wear or the people we associate with or what experiences we have or what we can put on Instagram, all of those things. We start to measure ourselves by those things. But God calls us not to measure ourselves by those lenses. And that's what the renewing of your mind is. It's by taking off those lenses and putting on new ones. So some of you you may have seen, as you drive through Tableview and you head towards Milnerton, if you look to your left, they're busy working on an area of the Flay area there. I don't know if you've noticed. Now, it's been interesting to see because initially there was just these mechanical shovels removing mud and reeds. And then slowly now you can see they're building walls. 
and walls of stone. And they're obviously trying to direct the, the water in time for this kind of storm season, rain season. And I actually Googled that yesterday and found a whole 300-page document on that project, which I didn't read. because it's. <laughs> but, but what was interesting is they have a plan to, to allow the stormwater system to work as it should so that it doesn't flood, so that the water flows where it should flow. And I was thinking about that when I was preparing this sermon. What, what often happens in our lives by the things in the world is those things become like that mud. The things in our world that become like our concerns, the comforts of this world, the sins of this world become like mud and like those reeds and it becomes thick and sticky. I don't know if you've seen the kind of stuff they pull out there. It's really nasty. And so that's what happens if we allow those things to take root and we allow that the wrong thinking to settle in our hearts. It becomes all stodgy and muddy. And then we like, Lord, show me your hand, but we're so stuck in the mud that it's very difficult. And so what the scripture is talking about by the renewing of our minds, it's saying, Lord, God's bringing that mechanical shovel and he's digging out the mud. He's digging out the reeds to get to what's truly important, what's truly in our hearts. And I believe that's what God is at work because we want to see God bring miracles, right? We want to see our faith performing great things. But often the problem is we're stuck in the mud. Often we have allowed the wrong thinking into our hearts. And as a result, that faith can't flow. It's almost like those, our, the renewed mind creates those, those walls that would allow the water to flow where it should flow. And if, unless we renew our mind, it's that mud is sitting there. And so what I'm talking about this morning is to allow God to renew our minds. And so we're going to look at a few sections of Scripture in the Gospel of Mark. So open up your Bible to the, to the Gospel of Mark. Now, I'm not going to deal with all of the passages in detail. I'll just reference them. But go to Mark chapter 6, verse 34. Mark chapter 6, verse 34 is Jesus was preaching to the crowds. And there were these big crowds that had been listening to Jesus all day, and they were tired, and they were hungry. And it says there that Jesus had compassion on them. He felt compassion for them. And he went to the disciples, and he said, how many loaves do you have? Go and see, in verse 38 of, of Mark chapter 6. How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And what did they find? They had five loaves of bread and two fish, and we know the story. 5,000 people were fed. 5,000 people were fed in that miracle of God. And then they gathered up 12 baskets of leftover bread. Okay, can you imagine? 5,000 people, it's five loaves, two fish, 5,000 people are fed. It's a miracle. God doing amazing things. Then we carry on in Mark 8. We see a second miracle. So go, go over to Mark 8 verse 1. Again, we see a picture of the crowds are there. They're listening to Jesus. And as they listen to Jesus, Jesus is preaching to them. And then he has compassion because he sees that he's hungry. And I love, I love if you listen to that, that Jesus has compassion. And I think often we forget that heart of God, that heart of compassion to see us as humans with actual needs. And he, he has compassion. It not, wasn't the disciples who said, we better feed these guys. They were like avoiding the topic. But Jesus said, they must be hungry. And he had compassion. And I believe in our lives, Jesus is looking at your life with compassion. And he's looking and saying, what, what is the need here? And then we see the miracle. And so in the second, in Mark 8, we see that there were 4,000 people. There were seven, if I've got it correctly, seven loaves of bread. 4,000 people were fed. And there were seven baskets of bread left over. And if you look at these two stories, you'll see that there the amount of, the more people, the bigger the miracle, the more left over there was. And so often we have, our, in our thinking, we have the wrong perspective. We look at how little we have. Whereas God did something. He said, five loaves, two fish, 5,000 people, 12 baskets left over. Done. That's the God we serve. But what we tend to do is we tend to make God smaller. 
So we saw those two miracles. The disciples had lived those two miracles. They were the ones who were handing out the baskets, getting those. I don't know what they did with the 12 baskets of leftover bread. Maybe they ate them for breakfast the next day. Hey, they made butter pudding. Or I don't know, what do you make bread, bread and butter pudding? They did something. And so they saw that blessing. They saw that blessing in their lives. But then we go to Mark chapter 8, verse 13, and we see the following picture. And it says, and he left them, got into the boat again, and he went to the other side. He had just been talking to the Pharisees, and we'll come back to the Pharisees. Now they had forgotten to bring bread. And they only had one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread. Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not understand? Because they'd seen the miracle of the 5,000. They'd seen the miracle of the 4,000. And then they get into the boat and they went, oops, we forgot the bread. Oh no, we got one bread, loaf of bread. And now all they were, they were stressed. And so we see Jesus kind of going, guys, they'd been walking with Jesus. They'd seen his miracles. But in that moment, they still doubted. In that moment, their minds had not been renewed and they were still seeing the lack and it's interesting, if you think about the love of God, often we make this mistake where we go, Lord, the problem I'm in is because I've messed up. And often that's the case, right? And then we say, and the enemy lies to us and said, well, God's not going to come through because you, you're the one who messed up there. You don't go to God because you messed up. And he keeps us in this little trap of accusation. And he, he kind of... And you can see even the disciples, they're stressing a little bit about this. Why didn't we bring bread? And they're probably blaming each other, you know. You forgot the bread, and why didn't you bring the bread? And, you know. And, but this is what's happening. But Jesus doesn't kind of come at them hard because they've left the bread. Instead, what he does is he wants to remind them of the lessons they should have learned of the 5,000 and the 4,000. So I'm going to make a few points about thinking. We're talking about the renewal of our minds. And so the first one is that wrong thinking seeps through our lives like leaven. And so Jesus here said, watch out to them. Watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And really what he was doing, he was saying, watch out for the thinking. So leaven is yeast that's baked into bread. When the bread goes into heat into the oven, the yeast does whatever yeast does. And it makes the, the bread rise, and we now have nice, a nice loaf of bread. You're going to be hungry by the end of the service. You're going to want to go buy a nice, fresh loaf of bread. And so that's what yeast does. But it takes heat to do so. And often in our lives, when heat is applied, when something comes and there's heat, we see exactly what the leaven is. We see exactly what, what we're believing, what we're holding on to. And then we can see the kind of bread that emerges. You know, it might be horrible bread, like rye bread, or, <laughs> sorry, I don't like rye bread, or it might be good bread. So what is the leaven? What is the yeast? What is your way of thinking? And he was challenging the leaven of the Pharisees, because the Pharisees, he had just had an encounter a couple of verses before with the Pharisees. And with the Pharisees, he was saying, they were like, show us a sign, and he was angry with them. He was frustrated with them. But also the Pharisees had this thing as they were always about the approval of others. They would pray on the street corner so everyone could see them praying. They would give so everyone sees them giving. And so they were all about the approval of others. Then he said, so beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, but also beware of the leaven of the, of the Herodians, of Herod. And remember Herod, he was all about political power. He was all about, even when Jesus was crucified, he didn't want to, he kind of washed his hands and onskult. He says, no, I'm not, 
I'm not going to, I'm not going to take responsibility for this. It's them who did it. And he, he didn't want to take responsibility because he was worried about what the people would think. And so part of our wrong thinking comes from the problem of looking for the approval of others. And that's wrong thinking in our lives. It's wrong thinking about how we address things in our home, in our marriages, in our finances, in our workplace. When we start from the perspective of what are others going to think? What are people going to think? Instead of what is God saying into the situation? So, I mean, even if we look back in Genesis, what did Eve do? She was worried about the serpent. And the serpent was saying, well, didn't God say? And and in the end, she she kind of was seeking the approval of the serpent. And then then Adam, in his great wisdom, he didn't want to upset Eve, right? Which is always a wise thing to do. Don't upset your wife. But he, he, again, was seeking the approval of man, or Eve, and sinned. And that's often what we do. We do things because we have wrong thinking, and that wrong thinking comes from where because we're seeking the approval of others. And so I want to encourage you to think about your life. What in your life are you living based on seeking the approval of others? So a few scriptures just to remind you of this. Galatians 1.10 says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please a man, I would not be a servant of Christ, ain't I? Okay, so we shouldn't be basing our lives, our thinking on trying to please man. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. We're meant to trust in God. Jeremiah 17, verse 5 says, Thus says the Lord, cursed, that's quite a, Strong word. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Now, if we look at our communities and our society, often what do we see? We see that curse because people are basing their lives, basing what they do, basing the decisions they make on what will people think. Not saying, Lord, what do you think? What does the God of all creation think? Because verse 7 continues. It says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. And I believe there's people here this morning who you've been trusting in man. You've been looking at your circumstances and you've been trusting in man. And God's encouraging you and challenging you this morning to trust him It says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose whose trust is in the Lord. It repeats it. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. That's a very different picture. But how often we base our thinking on what will other people think. And so my challenge, even reading this, even battling with the need for rest in my life, was to say, Lord, help my thinking to be based on what do you think, not on what others think. Lord, what are you saying I must do? Not on what the world and everything and, and kind of our culture is defining. So some of us need to repent, me included, to looking for the approval of man. So our thinking is wrong. Wrong thinking also comes from having the wrong starting point. Verse 17 of Mark 8 says, And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Their starting point was wrong. They had seen in those previous miracles where God had said to them, What do you have in your hand? What do you have? And they had said, We have five loaves, we have two fish, we have seven loaves. Now, what, are they, what does Jesus see the disciples doing? And you can see, he's like, Why are you looking at what you don't have? Why are you looking at what you don't have? And for some of you, that's the problem. You're looking at what you don't have. You're saying, I can't move forward because I don't have. I can't grow in my marriage because we don't have. I can't excel in my workplace because I don't have. I can't reach out to this person and bring the love of Jesus because I don't have. And I believe God's challenging me and you 
to have the right starting point to instead not say, why don't I have bread? So what in your life are you building on what you don't have? Are you building on what you don't have? Now, we need to be renewing our thinking. So I've spoken about our wrong thinking. Our wrong thinking comes from having the wrong starting point, what we don't have. Our wrong thinking comes from seeking the approval of others instead of God. But now we see the words of Jesus here. And this is Jesus in verse 18 says, Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear, and do you not remember? What he's saying to them is, remember, remember those previous miracles. Have you not seen God's hand? Have you not seen God's power? And I want to ask you those questions. If you look at the circumstances you're facing, maybe the fact that you don't have bread in whatever form that looks in your life. You don't see what you would like to see. And you're looking at that and Jesus is saying, do you remember? Do you remember? Do you see with your eyes? Because we're meant to, to remember what God has done for us. We're meant to go back, even in Revelation 12, I think it is, it talks about there's, there's power by the blood of Jesus and the word of our testimony. And so we're meant to remember what God has done. Has gone, let's see a show of hands. Has God done a miracle in your life somewhere? Okay. But often what we do is we don't look at that. We look, okay, I'm stuck in the mud now. We don't see the fact that God shifted us out of the mud last week, last year, five years ago. And I believe God's challenging us to remember. What do your eyes see? What do you hear? Do you not remember? Do you not remember? Psalm 119. Now, we're not going to read the whole of Psalm 119. It's quite long. Everyone's saying amen. Amen. Your word, verse 105, says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And so when we need to remember, we go to God's word. And we say, Lord, what are your promises? Lord, what, are your, what is your word saying to me? What is your word saying in my situation? Lord, what is truth here? Because the enemy wants to, you to be stuck in the mud with the lie, with the accusation. He wants you to be stuck there. And what God's word says is go to the word, go to the light, shine his light on the situation. So your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I've sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I'm severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. Remember, the wicked have laid a snare for me but I do not stray from your precepts. Verse 111, your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. And so I want to challenge you, you might not have testimonies even. You might say, I've not seen God bring the miracle. I've not seen God come through in my life in the way that, that I would like to see. I've seen God's done miracles in my cousin's life, in my, but I've not seen God. But even it says your testimonies, Lord. So God's testimonies, which is God's word. God saved Esther and used her to save a nation. God used Joseph to save a nation. God used Gideon, weak Gideon, who was insecure and worried about himself. God used him. And so God, we look at God's word. If you don't have a personal testimony, we go to God's word. God's word is full of testimonies of God bringing resurrection power. God bringing power into our situations. And so this scripture tells us that your testimonies are my heritage. We as Christians can claim those things. We can walk in the power of God because God's word is true. God is still the same God. He's still active in the world. And so part of our challenge in our society, in our community, is we are, we're plodding along stuck in the mud. We're not allowing his thinking to renew our minds. We're not saying, Lord, your power at work in my, in my workplace. Why should my workplace be suffering? Lord, I want to see your power here. Let's trust you for my, your power to be at work in my workplace. Lord, why am I battling in my home? Why is there conflict in my home? Lord, your power in my home. Lord, your presence in my home. That's what we're trusting God for. We're asking for his inheritance. Are you seeing what God is doing? 
as that scripture, as Jesus challenged us in that scripture, are you seeing what he is doing? What do you have in your hands? Do you have eyes that can't see? Do you have ears that can't hear? And he says, can you at least remember? And so my challenge, as I bring this, this service to a close this morning, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, is to say, what are you allowing to feed your soul? Are you allowing wrong thinking to feed your soul? Are you allowing the things of the approval of man to feed your soul? Are you allowing your own worries and fears and doubts to feed your soul? And really what I'm challenging us to do is to allow God's word to come and sweep out that mud like a big earth-moving machine and just sweep it away. But it means we need to be in God's word. It means you need to be saying, Lord, this is your word. This, this situation, it needs this word. And we apply God's word to that situation. And then as we apply God's word, it's like that machine just goes, moves the mud out the way. And then we can see clearly. Then faith can flow in our lives. And so that's what I'm encouraging you and I to do this morning. How many loaves do you have? What do you see? What have you heard? What can you remember? And so part of this, even the sermon, was saying, Lord, I'm feeling physically weak this week. I actually took the time to rest. Because I had the sermon I knew I was needing to prepare. And I'm like, Lord, you help me. And God helped me. He pointed me to resources. He helped me. But I had to rely on him, not on me. And so for a lot of you, I believe God's challenging you to rely less on yourself. To allow him to move. And I believe he's reminding you to say, do you not remember? Do you not remember his righteous hand? Do you not remember the promises that he's made over your life? The things he's spoken over your marriage? The words that he's spoken over your business? Do you not remember? Can I ask us to stand? For some of us, we're starting from the place of what we do not have. And I believe those are areas, if we're starting from a place of what we do not have, I believe there's a moment where you need to say, Lord, forgive me for that. Forgive me for focusing on what's not, what the bread I don't have. But rather put my focus on what Jesus is doing, what he has done. And allow his word to, to kind of rechannel the muddy muddy flay ground of our hearts and so Lord I pray right now Father God that you will come and I pray Lord God that you will remind people of your truth I pray that you will remind people of your word I pray that you will remind people of promises there's people here this morning even as I'm praying right now that you've said there's no future there's no hope and it might be because you're old it might be because you are in the wrong space. But the word of God this morning is, he, remember. Remember who He is. Don't look at the mud. Look to your God. Don't look at the reeds that are trying to trap you. Look to your God. Don't look at what you don't have. Look to who our God is. We hope you were blessed by that word. For more information, visit our website at everynationwestcoast.org. Hope to see you next time.